Next up, we're going to have Steve Dearden come and talk to us all about the uh, business case for the Woosh system and the ROI and how it can work for large and small dams on all river systems. Steve? What I was going to do was uh, just talk a little bit about some of the more business aspects and comparing our solution to conventional fish passage. If you uh, put them side by side, your conventional passage typically has a large construction footprint. It involves concrete involves planning that may take months, may take years to actually uh, plan and install a fish passage installation. You know, as we've been able to show, they typically have an adverse effect on the fish in terms of energy that they have available to continue their migration to spawn successfully. Our solution, because it requires less energy, helps the reproductive effort of those migratory species. The other thing that's really interesting about conventional passage is that unless you manually sort the fish that are going through the fishway or the lift system, you do have uncontrolled invasive spread. If you look at the Great Lakes as an example, there are many native species in the Great Lakes that the agencies would really like to get into the tributary streams of the Great Lakes, but they don't put fish passage in at the obstructions on those streams specifically because they don't want things like sea lamprey to spread further into the headwaters for the for the Great Lakes. And so a, a conventional passage solution is not going to help you control invasive spread. Looking over on the uh, whoosh side, you know, we're more cost effective. We have less of an impact on the environment because the construction overhead of our system is way less than any kind of a fish ladder fish lift or trap and haul facility is going to be. We take typically months to deploy. You know, we, we have this selective passage component where we can decide what it is that we're going to pass and what it is that we're not going to pass. We can also optimize the performance because we're gathering so much data with a scanning system and reliable counts, data about the size of the fish and everything else that are going through the system. It is a very different approach to fish passage, and there are lots of compelling reasons why it's a better solution for putting in those uh, river systems. Let's just talk about a few of the uh, business reasons that this is, this is so good for, for passage. Particularly out in the west here, uh, when we look at the high head passage cost, our equivalent systems are somewhere around 20% or less of the cost of a typical solution to uh, pass fish over the dam. You know, it's, it's a little closer on a low head dam, but it's still very, very significant. The O&M costs are a lot lower too. These systems are designed to be completely autonomous. You don't actually have to be there to monitor them. You can get them to phone home if something's wrong, or you can observe the uh, performance of the facility from a remote office. The modularity of the system and the capability that we've designed into it, the features that Jim was talking about, allow you to go over any dam. I'll show you some of the significant numbers in a moment. It gives you the opportunity to do active fisheries management, so the ability to sort hatchery from wild, do invasive control, and select the species that you're going to pass. Going back to the Great Lakes as an example, a lot of the funding comes from the management of the fisheries in the Great Lakes and sales of fishing licenses. And a number of years ago, they introduced Chinook and Coho and Sockeye, I believe, into the Great Lakes. In some cases, they actually do want to pass those fish into the tributary streams to keep, keep those populations going for the uh, commercial and recreational fishing, even though they're invasives. But in other cases where they really want to focus on restoration of the native species, they don't want them to pass. So we're envisaging in the Great Lakes that we're going to have to be putting in some systems that allow Pacific salmonids to pass and other systems that don't. You know, it's just a selection in the setup of the system. A couple of more important points, though, is one is that you put this in instead of or replacing a traditional fish ladder, and all of a sudden you're not using water for fish passage. As Jim said, you're only using a, a few gallons per hour for the lubrication purposes. If you're powering a Daniil or the false weir, 
you can use tailrace water anyway so you're not actually spilling water down the dam in order to affect your fish, fish passage. That can be translated into power savings and it's a relatively simple thing to look at the power profile for the dam, figure out when they would prefer not to be spilling water down the ladder because the water is scarce because it's July, August, September or whatever the months may be and what that value can be translated back into power savings which, which obviously plays into your business too. We can show that uh, you have water savings by putting, uh, putting one of our systems in. The other thing that uh, Vince alluded to is that you can have a, a very incremental approach to doing fish passage at a dam. You can pick a particular species, put in a pilot system, just move that species, tune the system in terms of entry placement and exit placement, and then incrementally add features and add species as you go on. That's not possible with a fish lift or with a fish ladder where you do the paper design, then you commit to the facility, you build the facility, and then you spend all your time doing adaptive management to figure out how to get the fish to go where you want them to go. It's very, very different how you deploy our technology and how you develop it to make sure that you get successful fish passage. One of the flexible positioning of the entrance means that attraction water is way less of a consideration because you figure out where the fish are and then you place the entrance versus with a ladder or a fish lift or a trap and haul facility, you're often physically constrained by the layout of the facility and road access and what else might be there as to which side of the river you have to place the entrance, which side of the river you have to place the exit. We can put the exit on one side, the entrance on the other, and we can move the entrance around on a floating platform if you want to optimize the positioning. Jim talked about this a little bit. I just want to skip quickly through this. This is showing the different tube sizes and the ranges of fish sizes. It also talks a little about power consumption and lubrication and so on. But I want you to look at that uh, chart on the top right there, which shows the relative circumference of the fishes and the ranges of sizes that uh, can be accommodated by each tube. So you can see there's a lot of overlap and when you have similarly sized fish, there's lots of tolerance for putting a fish that's uh, big for one tube in the next tube up, in which case it would be small for that tube. But you can see that the system has lots of tolerance, so the sorting algorithm is not that critical in terms of making sure that the uh, fish goes in tube A or tube B. So yeah, I talked a little bit about the O&M considerations. You know, you've got autonomous operation, remote monitoring and diagnostics. There's, there's a little uh, picture on the right-hand side there that gives you an idea of what the remote monitoring portal looks like. This is kind of the control panel that you can um, see what's going on with all the various components. As I said before, you know, you've got these uh, design life expectations where, you know, you might have to replace some of the traditional industrial components every 10, 15 years or so. And the tube, as we've already described, we've, we've had tubes move millions of fish and not require replacing yet. So we're expecting a pretty long design life for those two. This is a quick little list of species that we have moved through our system. You can see we've got American Shad and Gizzard Shad there, the East Coast species that you're probably interested in. But there's a whole bunch of other species. Uh, a lot of these are common on the Great Lakes too. This is a, a little bit of simple math that uh, shows you the kinds of dam heights that we can go over given the distances that Jim talked about. So on this chart, you see the, the white column is the length of the tube. The green numbers are the angle of the tube relative to horizontal. And then uh, just looking at the tube length and the angle of the tube, you can see the kinds of heights that we can go over. Tallest dam in the US is somewhere in this region here. It's about 770 feet. But that's typically the distance from the foundation to the crest. When you're talking about the, the hydraulic difference, 
that's usually a lot less. So we're very confident that we can go over any dam in the US and have tube enough to spare so that you can still play games with the entrance and the exit. This is just a picture, again, Jim's already talked about this. This is uh, to show tube size, number of fish per minute, and the uh, tube length. So you can see it, it kind of asymptotes down to about 10 fish per minute for any of the tube sizes we're talking about, but that only happens when you get up to 600 feet or so. Typically on the East Coast in, in the central region, you're gonna be operating somewhere in this kind of range anyway, with probably less than 250 feet of tube. So this is, uh, you know, Nymphs Portland. This is their communicated position on handling fish. Fortunately, out on the East Coast there, you don't have very many ESA fish other than the Atlantic salmon. But we do have a, a project with Brookfield where we are going to be handling ESA salmon and the East Coast, uh, the Northeast office of NIMPS is actually supportive of that process. This slide here really shows how we can minimize the debate and how we can easily move forwards with projects uh, as far as NOAA is concerned. Simple little uh, direction here. There's also a, a flow chart. I'm not going to walk through this in detail, but it again helps us go through that decision-making process to see where the agencies are going to be concerned and where we may need to get into further consultation with them. Fortunately, on the East Coast, as I said, you're not dealing with a bunch of, of ESA species. And so a lot of this uh, regulatory issues are going to be dealt with at the state level versus at the, uh, at the federal level, which makes things considerably easier. And again, uh, I'm not going to go into this too much, but this, uh, this gives you an idea of why we're wonderful. There are lots of different aspects that you can, you can look at. It's interesting, you know, Janine, Janine referred you to the uh, sites where we've got all our studies on the website. And one of the things that she did recently was she went back and, and found a couple of papers that show that on traditional fish passage systems in the last 50 or 60 years, there have only been about 90 papers written. That's maybe, maybe 10 studies a year on traditional fish passage worldwide they're very inconsistent and they haven't gone into a lot of detail and there's not a lot of consistent metrics that have been applied to the efficacy of those fish passage solutions and yet in the last four years we've done 18 studies ourselves and we're looking at very very specific attributes relatively speaking Wush has had far more testing and far more rigorous testing than many of the traditional methods. Here's the key takeaways. From an economic perspective, it costs less to deploy, it costs less to operate. From an environmental perspective, we can select what it is that we pass. The fish pass much quicker, they have more energy, they survive better for the rest of the migration, they survive better for spawning, and you get an improved fishery result. We don't use water, that means you know, opportunities for you to harness the water that they're no longer spilling. It means more revenue for the dam owner operator. It's relatively easy to calculate what those savings are and what you can do with them and what that power is worth. And you know, if it's an irrigation dam, more water is available for irrigation. You know, just, just from a social perspective and a marketing perspective, I think our solution provides something that's innovative and exciting and, and can change the way people think about hydropower. It is a clean energy source, but people need to be more excited about it. And this is one way that we can add some excitement into the mix and into the, into the dialogue.